So hello everybody, uh, welcome to this RSA webinar. I'm Dr. Meredith Doig, President of the Rationalist Society of Australia, which is Australia's oldest society of people who are in favour of science and evidence as opposed to superstition and bigotry. Uh, now, before we begin, I'd like to invite you all to join with us in acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia uh, and their continuing connections to land and to sea and to community. Uh, tonight, in the lead up to the New South Wales election, uh, education and education funding is back on the agenda. Uh, and our guest tonight is Chris Bonner, who's well qualified to speak about this to us. Chris is a retired secondary school principal and was formerly head of the New South Wales uh, Principals Council. Uh, Chris has written a number of books uh, and written papers about the topic of school funding, sometimes in conjunction with Jane Caro, whom I'm sure uh, a lot of you uh, will recognise her name. She's another crusader for the value of public education in this country. Uh, Chris has jointly authored papers on Australian schools in conjunction with uh, or in association with the Centre for Policy Development uh, and the Gonski Institute for Education. And tonight we'll be speaking, or he'll be speaking, uh, about the main major messages from his latest book, which is called um, Waiting for Gonski, How Australia Has Failed Its Schools, which he's written with teacher Tom Greenwell. And tonight's topic, of course, is particularly timely because, uh, I'm, as I'm sure many of you, like me, read the newspapers uh, this morning and saw a lot of leading articles about the NAPLAN results. Um, and Chris, I don't know whether have you been besieged by journalists today to speak about the NAPLAN results? Uh, subdued siege, I think, Meredith, two, two or three. And uh, it's, uh, you can almost plot out the year in terms of what educational issues are going to arise at what times of the year. And you can sort of, you can sort of prepare yourself in some way. <laughs> that shows you how long you've been doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, look, as usual, I'm going to invite Chris to speak to us for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll head into some questions and answers. And I'd invite you all, if you do have questions that occur to you, uh, or even comments as Chris goes through his talk, please feel free to use the chat box if there are questions. In particular, if you want to ask a question of Chris, can you just begin your chat with a cue or question, and that ju will just alert me to the fact that it's a question rather than a comment. Um, and then I will try to wrap this up uh, at uh, 8.30, so one hour as usual. Okay, with that introduction, um, Chris, may I invite you to uh, let us know what have you, what were you talking about in your latest book? Yeah, thanks for asking, Chris. Um, and I'd like to also acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Darug people uh, and pay my respects to all this past and present. Um, my background is that of a public educator who has long viewed the rise of private schooling in Australia with considerable alarm not least because it was impacting on things like the public, the secular, the free, the inclusive and the community schooling that I grew up with, the schools of my childhood. And over the years, I was realised realizing that the advocacy of public education, um, <clears throat> we, when we promoted these things, wasn't cutting through. The debate was being driven by notions of choice, private, exclusive, individual freedom, value, success. And of course, a lot of those things were a bit of a nonsense. Um, but private and, uh, private and exclusive schooling uh, had captured the language backed by powerful lobbies uh, that captured the politicians in turn. Mm. Um, so by the start of uh, this century, the, the shift of school enrolments from public to private was very noticeable. Um, not only numbers, I've got a graph here. This, uh, please bear with me. This is, um, this is a sort of a PowerPoint. Well, 
a powerless <laughs> point, I'd say, really. Um, I'm, I only have two of these, so it won't be too bad. Bring, bring that a graphic. bit closer to the, to the camera. Oh, but they won't see me. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So um, you can see the public line uh, going up and up and the private line yes. sort of flatlining a bit. Look, what so it is, that's, it's, that's family income divide, is it? Yes, it shows the representation of low-income families in the enrolments of each sector. Right. And it shows the increasing proportion of low income families in the public sector and the opposite in, in, uh, in, uh, in private schools. And of course, around about this time, John Howes has created quite a big private school constituency. Mm -hmm. um, advocacy for public schools became much harder. And this shifting enrollment created a very segregated system. And we, we could see what was happening. Um, having public and inclusive schools alongside schools which are both publicly and privately funded and could discriminate was always going to be problematic, especially on a very uneven playing field of, of school obligations, rules and accountabilities. <clears throat> um, and of course, in more recent years, uh, private schools have become better resourced. So concerns about equity and uh, fairness have risen, have risen again. A problem of, problem of school funding, of course, that has never gone away. It triggered another school review, as we know, the Gonski Review. So the other never-ending headlines about, uh, have been about school achievement. Early debates were about public versus private schools, less so recently because schools with similar demographics, when they are compared, there's no difference. And more people know that. Um, but... The, um, Do you think that's true? You think the, the public has become a bit more sophisticated in understanding yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's that true. And I, I mean, I've monitored the media and particularly the letters pages going back over a decade and a half. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, there's a far more sophistication in responses of readers uh, in terms of the things that they bring up, which is very, very encouraging, I think. Hmm. Um, the, ne the other never-ending headlines... <clears throat> um, uh, or, uh, sorry, in relation to school achievement, um, international testing and comparisons have shown that the overall levels of student achievement in Australia in this century were initially okay. Now they became a bit so-so and are now generally considered to be on the slide. And this has ushered in a period of panic-driven <laughs> reform of schools based on assumptions that it's entirely their fault. They need to do better and failing that, they need to be punished. Um, so we've done a lot of that. Uh, There's a lot of success. teacher bashing. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, uh, which must come as a great surprise that teachers don't want to stay in the system. Hmm. Um, so what's wrong? Well, our decline has been in parallel with the expansion of private and exclusive schooling. But politicians and policymakers are too terrified to join those dots uh, between poor system performance and privatisation. But they may have to, because the last 20 years have seen far more research into the relationship between separating kids into different schools, especially by level of family advantage and the parlous state of overall student achievement. Um, the data behind the MySchool website over the last decade clearly shows the extent of this separation, most notably with strugglers increasingly found in schools with other strugglers. So we have this socio-educational hierarchy of schools with independent schools uh, created by who they enrolled, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in every community, you'll find there's an independent school at the top, Catholic schools down a bit further, and the government schools towards the bottom uh, of what I call this the Ixia tree. In other words, the rank of socio-education. I call, let's, let's use SES as a nice mm -hmm. abbreviation. Mm -hmm. Now, this matters a lot. And the Gosky Review found, amongst other things, that sorting students in this way has a strong impact on the educational outcomes achieved by all students at low SES schools, especially. And the evidence from PISA is that countries that segregate students aren't among the global high achievers. So if you really want to stuff up a school system, pull out the achievers and put all the strugglers together. And this is, well, this is what happens. Interesting, I, 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 in New South Wales, I plot, and I've done it for the other states too, in the case of New South Wales, it's the high school certificate, high achievers. And the question in this graph is, where have they gone? Now, you'll notice one of the lines go up. And that is, that's the trajectory of enrolments in, uh, of, of, sorry, 
the trajectory of where these high achievers are found. They're increasingly found in high SES schools and far less frequently found in low SES schools. And this is a really interesting measure because, you know, we talk about NAPLAN and PISA and all this sort of stuff. This is a measure of where the high achieving students are. And they have certainly, certainly shifted to high SES schools, leaving the strugglers almost literally in a class of their own, their own peers. Now, smarter countries try to spread kids around more evenly by SES and by ability, uh, but not in Australia. And with 50, almost 50 selected schools, New South Wales is firmly in the dumb uh, category. So for Australia, the solution, which is obviously avoided, is to reduce the enrolment practices which enable some schools to choose kids from preferred families, leaving others behind. Of course, they don't discriminate directly. There is a raft of, there's a raft of measures, entrance tests, fees, prior school performances, interviews, and so on. That does all the discriminating for them. And that's what choice and competition between schools in Australia is really all about. Schools compete with each other to gain preferred students. So we need to make more of our schools far more inclusive to better spread the load and the gains. And the more, well, obviously, I suppose the most direct way to do that is to stop funding private schools and make them become, as their name suggests, private. Um, and that could happen over time. The higher fee schools especially um, uh, have got a lot of press uh, uh, their own making, of course, because they've been caught behaving badly in so many ways. Yes. Uh, and of course, the op opulence of these school grades. But down the food chain, it gets a bit harder because as I, met, I mentioned John Howard's constituency, well, they pay fees and they get public funding to avoid cert certain cohorts, not sit next to them. Um, it sounds a bit harsh, but I think that's a big part. That is definitely a big part. Shifts of students from one sector or one school to another are always towards higher SES schools, regardless of sector. But of course, John Howe's constituency have become used to this and, and they vote. And any threat to their public funding puts their pressure groups into overdrive. Um, Ross Gittins once asked, do politicians really want to upset the Catholic bishops and be under attack from hundreds of pulpits on the following Sunday? And I was having a conversation with Meredith earlier. We were talking about, well, you know, don't, don't short sell the, the, the congregation because they're, uh, they are certainly, uh, in many ways, ahead of their leaders, of course. Anyway, we're told so often that Catholic and independent schools funding them actually saves the taxpayer. But the funding of private schools has risen so much that two thirds of them now get close to the same funding as do public schools with similar student demographics. Many get more. Now, of course, on average, they don't, but averages mislead. Public schools enroll most of the high cost kids from high cost families in high cost places. Well, of course, the averages are going to be different. Um, but like so much on school education, especially money and achievement, you have to compare apples with apples. And there's more, there's more about this in this, uh, and this is a commercial break, uh, <laughs> Meredith, there's more about this in this fabulous book, which I'm sure everybody has a copy of, um, uh, marked heavily uh, as uh, is, is my copy. We, we, um, we will send out a link to the book <laughs> when we uh, send out the um, recording of this webinar, Chris. <laughs> um, but of course, the similarly funded private schools still charge fees. So it's the fees mm. at almost any level that sustains our regressive socioeconomic hierarchy of schools. It's the fees, along with other discriminators, which have to go. And this gets us closer to a solution. This is how it goes. <clears throat> this is where it gets controversial. Other countries were smarter when they began funding private schools. In the 1970s in New Zealand, uh, the New Zealanders gathered the Catholic sect together and said something like this, yes, we know you're going broke, so we will fully fund you if you assume the obligations, operation and accountability of secular state schools. Oh, yes, you can retain your special character, but you must not charge fees. I, can I just say, what 
are those obligations and how is it different or how in New Zealand you're saying that the the government said to the Catholic school system uh, you have to assume the obligations of government schooling sure sure what sort well, of let, obligations? Let me give you an example. for example you must be you if you're if you're a Catholic school hmm. you can't turn away poor Catholics you know they have a right to be in your school too hmm. so you can't practice that sort of discrimination you can't <clears throat> and in that way, uh, the, the hierarchies that developed were very suppressed because Catholic schools, in fact, did enroll poor Catholics. And, uh, and uh, um, so their enrolment over time became, became more diverse. I think, I think Canada's a better comparison than New Zealand mm -hmm. because demographically the two were not exactly the same. Um, and, of course, it's done like that with variations in most of the OECD world. It's Australia that's the outlier. We need a common framework of responsibilities and obligations hmm. to ensure that all publicly funded schools are accessible to all kids. But isn't that what uh, ACARA, the Curriculum and Assessment Authority, is meant to set, a, a sort of a common framework? Uh, nobody does it. Nobody does it because it involves a level of uh, restructuring and intervention that uh, no government will, will take, uh, take on. ACARA cannot do it uh, on its own. And even ACARA, the analysis ACARA does of uh, schools um, doesn't really highlight the differences that I'm talking about. Hmm. We, should be able to, we might be able to get back to that. Um, now, of course, to fully fund all schools, um, it would cost about an extra one or 2% on what governments spend now on schools. Given the cost of school underachievement, that extra investment would be much cheaper than the ongoing personal, social, economic and productivity costs of doing nothing. Mm. It would potentially create a consensus about how we resource and regulate schools instead of what we have at the moment, which is a bit of a stalemate. Both public and private school advocates are sitting in trenches, lobbing grenades at each other. Uh, mm. Public educators don't want taxes propping up private schools, schools that exclude the public. Sounds reasonable. On the other side, those choosing private schools have long resented paying anything while others get a free education. And then if they pay fees, they expect something much better. <clears throat> now, of course, the politicians avoid the problem by saying that they believe in choice, which is about the most nonsense statement any politician can make. What, what, common... why, why, why is that nonsense statement? Because choice is really a topic that is it's a niche topic that only families that are advantaged have any right to talk about because they're the only ones that have choice. Mm. Um, but a common framework, um, a common public framework can support choice without creating social and economic segregation. At no cost, families could access schools that reflect their values and preferences and schools would no longer be defined by who they enrol and by who they reject. Taxpayer funding would no longer provide some students and schools with privileges not available to others. Uh, of course, it's not a leap in the dark. I mean, countries like New Zealand, Canada, Scotland, Belgium, Netherlands all illustrate that it's possible to provide choice and diversity while maximising equity and effectiveness. Canada, which is, as I say, demographically most like Australia, outclasses Australia when it comes to student achievement. So a common framework shows how both equity and choice can happen, and it addresses the root causes of declining achievement and growing disadvantage for our schools because we would be no longer gathering the disadvantage together in the schools that are free or currently free. Now, Tom, Tom Greenwell and I, fully, we fully understand that private school peak groups won't, won't want any of this. Uh, they get almost full funding now, and, and they don't have to enrol the poor. But if push comes to shove, they can be left exposed. You can imagine the conversation. You mean to say, Bishop, that you don't want poor Catholics in your schools? Or to others, you could say, so you're, you're saying that Anglicanism is for elites? Or, or is grammar to remain a code word for exclusion? Hmm. Uh, they would lose that... Um, high moral ground, the regressive underpinnings of private education would be seriously exposed and challenged. And it's high time we did that. Mm. At the same time, I don't, I don't minimise the agony that many public educators would feel. At, at what 
it amounts to admitting defeat on the secular purpose of publicly funding schools, that we lost that battle half a century ago. And unless we put that to one side, we're going to lose much more in the coming decades. The social class and student achievement divides in Australian schooling are increasing year by year. Mm. And this shows up in my school data. Uh, and I know that such a proposal put forward by Tom and myself. It'll promote as many questions as answers as, as it should, especially around the extent of comp compliance of a fully funded church school uh, with, far more, <clears throat> with far more strict guidelines. But we wanted to kick the door open uh, to a conversation about solutions and to invite others that have solutions, <laughs> put them forward, don't keep ignoring the problem, to start adding up the gains and losses of going in other directions uh, and most of all the cost of doing nothing because mm. nothing is what happens right now. And the real cost, including the kids, um, is mounting. Meredith, that's... That's the sort That's of things that I wanted to raise. Um, good intro. Good intro. Let that me just uh, summarise, uh, if I can, and see if I've got this right from what you're suggesting as a solution uh, to this wicked problem um, of Australia's school sector, which, as you say, is most unusual. We uh, have a, a tripartite school sector, which is very unusual in the rest of the OECD world. Um, but what you're saying is because the rich schools are getting richer and the poor schools are getting poorer, um, rather than fiddling around with the funding, which has been tried in the past mm -hmm. and that hasn't worked, mm -hmm. it seems, um, why don't you? Why don't we try something else? And you're saying, why don't we try um, banning selective schools? Essentially, that is, uh, all schools, be they um, independent or Catholic or uh, government, they're not allowed to um, select students on their what on SES or on yeah be on be on the reach of their of their uh, catchments and all that sort of stuff yeah because that's at the moment uh, catchments mean very little including in some government system right um, yeah yeah and, and and in in offering that I mean I know very well that the high fees schools especially would say go jump and uh, and they wouldn't want that in fact they their status would revert to the same status that equivalent schools have in other countries they are fully private and they get they get nothing or extremely low national funding model for some curricular stuff uh, from governments. So they would hive off from the whole system. So before I get to um, questions that have been put in the chat box and that have been sent in before, can I just clarify this? What you're suggesting is that all schools would banned from charging fees? Yes. So it would seem to me that lots of parents would say, fine, I'm going to send, I want to send my child to the richest school that I can possibly um, enrol my child oh, in. Oh, yes. How would, how would that work? Uh, absolutely, because along with this, <clears throat> you would have a far more rigid means-based school funding system than we have at the moment. With, with almost no exceptions, including government school systems, where, where the bulk of the funding goes. I mean, at the moment, we have base funding plus loading for disadvantage. In the system we're suggesting, the bulk of the funding would be loading for disadvantage. And if a school decides it wants to enrol high SES kids from advantaged families, then they'll pay a fee. They, they will pay a penalty in terms of the government funding. Okay, so it's not just your solution is not just um, banning selectivity, but it's also it, that's in conjunction with a change to the funding model. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, it has to. There, in fact, there, there. Are, I didn't go into this in great detail, but there are others. There's a whole lot of a whole range of things, including a table in our book uh, covering about seven or eight areas of operation of schools where. And the operation would change and become far more standardised between the between the currently the systems. 
And there may indeed be uh, the very rich schools who say, we don't want to enroll um, jo yeah. Joanne from the local yeah. uh, family milk bar, yeah. um, who is low SES, we don't want to enroll them. So we are going to um, give up any government yep. funding and just yep. go totally private. And we're only yep. going to take fees from the parents who choose to come to our school. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. There's one such school in Sydney that has done that already, actually. And, and interestingly, uh, the, the, the dependence of those schools on school fees has risen over the last decade. It's almost as if they've received a message that their government funding at some stage is going to be uh, considerably at risk. And incidentally, their government funding is tending to, in, um, uh, in some cases, that I, I can't plot that at the moment because I don't have the most recent data, but mm -hmm. their government funding obviously is being adjusted down according to the arrangements made in 2017. Okay. And do you have any inside information about whether uh, the current Labor government has in mind uh, further changes to the funding of independent or Catholic schools? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, and you can you can. <laughs> Not at all. Said, I don't have information, but uh, <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing coming out of yeah, Canberra that yeah. suggests that that's remotely near their agenda. Okay. All right. Um, interesting model, which is quite different from uh, what has been suggested in the past. Um, one thing that I would say, though, is that Sydney has a particularly high number of selective schools, which is not the same here in Melbourne. We have, I, I think there's less than 10. Somebody online might be able to uh, correct me on that. Yes. But it's not as large a feature of funding in Victorian schools as it is in New South Wales schools. Yeah, that's right. And the data clearly shows, in fact, I put a, put a paper inside Inside, uh, uh, published published by Inside Story, mm -hmm. a, a paper on the most recent research I've done into that, and it is easily demonstrated the impact on selective schools and partial selective schools on other schools is now quite easily demonstrated, um, and there's no excuse. Uh, I mean, basically, it it's it amounts to serious neglect by the New South Wales government, a, success, a serious succession of them, in fact, a, a serious neglect of the damage done by selective schools on comprehensive schools in New South Wales. Hmm. Uh, okay. Why don't we go to some of the uh, questions that have been sent in beforehand, and then I'll come back to the questions that have been put into the chat box. Hmm. Um, Tony Crins wrote in... Uh, <laughs> Religious schools teach or brainwash children to believe stories that are not true. They're neither proven nor logical. And Richard Dawkins has described teaching religion to schools as a form of child abuse. Um, do you think that claim is valid? Look, look, at one level, I don't know. I'm, I'm really equipped to answer that question. But, but, you know, it seems to me that if brainwashing is the purpose of religious schools, and that bottoms on church pews is a measure of their success, then they've manifestly failed. Um, um, after decades of funding church schools, Australia ranks very highly, doesn't it, uh, in the non-belief states, um, alongside most of Europe, hmm. which incidentally fully incorporates those schools into their state systems. Uh, and, and incidentally, I'm not, not talking about incorporating when we talk about a common framework, we're not talking about making church schools part of, part of the public sector. No way, that's not the same thing at all. Uh, but we're just insisting that It might they, be a good idea, though. Um, I wouldn't countenance it because um, I've always, and most public educators probably wouldn't anyway, because, they, they, you know, certainly the advocates are strong advocates for, 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 for secular schooling and, and really uh, getting as far as we have has been, uh, you know, not an easy experience for us even because, you know, you've got to, when I think of my childhood and the schools I grew up through and how successful they were, 
whatever. But then, but the interesting thing about the church schools, then the United States, which allegedly maintains separations of uh, church and states, mm -hmm. uh, borders on being a theocracy. I mean, you know. I Despite the fact of, that they don't have church school or not to the same extent. Well, that, yeah, that, that's the truth. They, they don't have uh, publicly funded church mm -hmm. schools, but they still uh, have a substantial religious uh, commitment in their communities. Um, mm -hmm. I have to think of teenagers, you know, the, the brainwashing. Um, I'd love to see someone who's successfully brainwashed an adolescent. That, mm, that, that, that well, can, that's a, that's, a that's another whole story <laughs> that we sorry, might have, sorry. have to come back to. <laughs> Let me go on to okay. the next question because yes, it's sure. from Jean Eli, um, whose name you would recognise. Uh, and she says the state aid experiment has failed in our time as it did in the 19th century. When will public education supporters shake off the fear of being called sectarian and confront the sectarian mm. system? Yeah. And I must say, I, you know, we, we spoke, as you mentioned earlier, that politicians seem to be very fearful of the so-called religious vote. And yet yes, yes. Uh, mm. we, that is the RSA, have commissioned research that shows pretty clearly that there is no such thing as the religious vote, or at least it's a very minor mm. thing. 86% mm. of people in Australia say that they explicitly, that religion does not influence their vote. What influences their vote is economic factors. Mm. But there is a correlation between some economic factors and religionists, people who, who oh, absolutely. affiliate with the religion. So people think that it's a religious vote, but in fact it's not. It's an economic vote. Oh, and the choice of school. Correlation. Yeah, and the, choice of, and, and, and the choice of schools is mm -hmm. a choice of a higher SES school. Um, but, of course, what it means is, is that the schools charging fees um, enrol middle, upper middle class, whatever, their families. Mm -hmm. um, look, I don't know. I don't know if I fear being called sectarian, but I mean, I spent years criticizing private education in areas where they weren't vulnerable at all, I don't think, at least in the public view. I made the deliberate decision years ago to, to focus on what was wrong with the way where we were heading on the basis of what I call the seven E's mm -hmm. things like excellence, equity, um, effectiveness, efficiency, efficacy. Um, um, and so, and so evidence, the things where our system was highly vulnerable and highly deficient. Mm -hmm. and, and concern about these things is far more widely spread. And you, we tap into, we tap into, we also tap into the big end of town because it's often the big end of town that's interested in those things. Um, and, and I think a different set of people are making, taking notice. Look, and I, look, my perspective is also this. I had a lifetime in public education from my first day in kindy to my last day as a school principal. Mm. I witnessed and I wore the consequences of my peers, my pupils and my profession under siege and what it was doing to our schools and lose. And in fighting back in a different way, I know I've lost some people who I've always admired and that probably won't change. But I hope some other things will. Uh, mm. I think that's where I'm coming from. Okay, I'm going to turn now to the uh, some of the items, the questions that have been placed in the chat box. Um, and I'll start with Alison Cortis, who is very involved in a group that you may know of. It's called Queensland Parents for Secular State Schools. Um, and Alison asks this, uh, when you were talking about... Um, competing private and public schools, she asks, could the over, the dropping, the decrease in the overall results be the political aim? Is that what some politicians actually want as an outcome? Alison, is, have I nod your head if I've <laughs> summarised your question correctly? Yes, I mean it's happened in America too, where they've I think they've deliberately tried to dumb down a big chunk of the population. 
Chris, That's, your views? That, I'd be, yeah, look, I'd be interested in reading more about that or finding out more about that, Alison. If you were able to put on the site some, some references there, because it's, uh, well, it certainly goes against the rhetoric mm. of politicians, but, of course, you judge politicians by what they do mm. rather than what they say. And, of course, what they do is to, uh, what they do is doing in um, disadvantaged families. But isn't it also, Chris, what they will continue to tolerate? I mean, if mm. if the outcomes for lower socioeconomic families are getting worse and worse and worse over the decades and the politicians are too afraid to actually stand up to the lobby lobbyists who uh, pressure them, to maintain the current system, even though the results for poorer kids are getting worse and worse. Isn't that something, you know, the, the, the standard that you ignore is that the standard that you walk by is the standard that you accept? Accept, yeah. And, and you know, that same analysis could apply to so many areas of social policy and public policy, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, and uh, that's not exclusive to schools. Um, You'd sort of proceed in hope, wouldn't you? And certainly after the last election, you proceed <laughs> well, in hope that that will change, but you keep coming up against barriers that they won't challenge. Well, I think, you know, we, we had a lot of hope when uh, the Gonski report came in uh, because it was supposed to be focusing on disadvantage. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. yet the outcome, yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, and look, Gonski, yeah, and that was that was partially a fault of the review, but also partly, not only politicians make compromises, but the Gonski panel made compromises in order to get some sort of result. And sure, they they actually didn't challenge the incredibly divisive impact of school fees. Hmm. Um, um, so that was that was sort of off the agenda. But and even the Carmel Commission. 30 or, 40 or so years previously, sort of wondered about that. My goodness, what will happen if this if we keep going this direction? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> what happened, happened. That's going right back to uh, Gough Whitlam days, isn't it? Um, let me just move on to the next question, which comes from Dale Bridge, who asks, uh, could you define the difference between SEA and SES and explain their relationship? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I should. Look, look actually, um, and I... I use SES as a sort of a, 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 a better known public measure. But there are two things. The SES, of course, is the Australian Bureau of Statistics measure, which includes such things as family incomes. The SEA, socio-educational advantage, is used by ACARA to measure the level of advantage of, of students in school enrolments. Um, and it includes such things as uh, family, family occupations, uh, family, uh, parents' level of education, uh, Originality, uh, location, uh, and that sort of thing. There's actually, I mean, there's a fair bit in common. There's a fair bit of commonality between the two measures. Mm -hmm. um, but the Ixia, of course, is the measure on the MySchool website. It, it is the measure of socio educational. Ixia? Yeah, index of uh, uh, index of community socio educational advantage. Mm -hmm. It's the index. It's the index of the level of advantage of the, of each school's enrolment. It's the most wonderful thing. Because before that, um, we, you know, you'd have a, a high fees school saying just before an election, oh, we enrol the poor. And you'd try to have a few parents working five jobs or whatever to show. Hmm. But that no longer happens. You know, conversations about schools uh, can, can easily be checked uh, against by, by anybody in the street with a computer and a mouse. You hmm. can find out, for example, in every local community, that hierarchy of schools, independent of the top, Catholic next and government next mm. in terms of level of SEA or SES, whatever, you know. Mm. So um, and, that's a, and that's a good thing. I'd like to believe that Julie Gillard believed that that would happen <laughs> when she introduced it. But it was a very neoliberal school reform, you know, to improve competition and make more information available also to improve choice and competition, which, of course, was a nonsense. It simply sent families increasingly in the direction of higher SES schools. Just um, reading the uh, the newspapers this morning, at least in Melbourne, the, the papers reported that uh, 
In fact, it was government schools that made up 16 of the state's top 20 performers. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that wouldn't surprise me. I, look, I, I really worry about NAPLAN mm -hmm. um, because I have seen schools make remarkable shifts. Um, and I don't know. I can't, from first-hand experience, say how much there is gaming of the system and teaching to the test, all this sort of stuff. Hmm. Um, but I would like to see NAPLAN results come out with a host of other measures that assess such things as student engagement mm -hmm. and commitment to school and long-term goals and, 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 and um, um, taking on greater challenges and all this sort of stuff, you know. It's, um, mm -hmm. Uh, and more, pers more personalised learning, which is linked to the, the real world in which they go to um, school and live. Is it measurable, Chris? Um, more so than it used to be, interestingly mm. enough. Mm. But um, Can I also uh, quote from this article from The Age? I think it was The Age or the um, Herald Sun, I'm not sure which. But it also said... And this goes to your issue about the peer effect, that if you have strugglers placed with strugglers, you're going to um, exacerbate that effect. And if you have high-performing kids placed with high-performing kids, that the peer effect ratchets up their outcomes anyway. But let me just uh, say that in the newspapers here in Melbourne today anyway, um, it said that schools with a high proportion of students from first-generation migrant families dominated the list of high-performing schools. Yep. Between 60% and 90% of students were from non-English speaking backgrounds in every school in the top 10 schools in Victoria. Yep, yep. Doesn't surprise me at all. So so that does, doesn't that sort of go against your idea of the peer effect? Because you've got no, because, no, because, students because, who are who are, who are uh, struck from a low socioeconomic background, who are yeah, yeah, struggling, yeah, yeah. and they're putting putting them together, sixty to ninety percent of students, but they still did very well. But, but but there's another layer on top of that, of course, which is not measured, and that is a sort of cult in, in, impact of of cultural background mm -hmm. um, on on student achievement, aspirational families, and certainly in Sydney, and I suspect Melbourne as well. Um, there are very asp aspirational families from East and South Asia in, mm -hmm. in parts of Sydney, Melbourne, where, and this is not measured in my school, but is certainly uh, a very, very important um, uh, element in mm -hmm. the high, high achievement profile of those schools. I mean, even when I was a school principal, I used to say, give me a busload, I was at Northern Sydney, a, a very Anglo drawing area, give me a busload of kids from down the railway line who I knew were, you know, non-Anglo kids who, who, whose pathway to the future was by doing very well in the, in the STEM subjects, especially maths. Give me a bus load in my school enrolment mm. <laughs> and I'll show you an achieving school. Mm. Um, Interestingly enough, a lot of these kids apparently from non-English speaking first generation migrant families were from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You, you always think of Asian students yeah. being very hard working, but these were from Afghanistan. Yes. Let's, let's, let's move on because there's a few mm -hmm. other sure. comments and questions that we'd like to get through. John Barrell uh, says, and I think maybe this will take this as a comment, just look at the religiosity of most of our politicians, especially the party leader, leaders, mostly Catholic. We have a big job ahead to change this problem. Uh, yes. So I, I think I'll take that as a, a yep, comment. Yep. Um, Jeffrey Williams right. says, religious schools want to teach their religious curriculum as well as the state's system's curricula, uh, but they want to get the same share of public funds as public schools whose priorities are different. Religious teaching is based on faith and ideology, not facts, similar to what um, Dale, uh, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Barrel was saying, should religious schools' um, faith-based curricula be closely examined and government funding be restricted if religious schools insist on teaching curricula which is at odds with the state's education agendas? Well, that's that's real. That's a really important point. Uh, and 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 uh, on paper, all schools 
uh, must are obliged to teach the the uh, the relevant state uh, federal curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, really Australian practice, curriculum. Mm -hmm. the Australian curriculum. The Now, in, in practice, that's really or enforced in very intermittent ways. And of course, what we're saying is that that we have, need to take that seriously. Now, of course, where where they do go astray on this. Um, there's been recently evidence of state authorities, especially, um, you know, cracking down and insisting uh, that the schools are accountable in this area. Um, and of course, even outside the curriculum area, I was, I was very impressed. I was very impressed this time last year mm -hmm. at the response to that dreadful school in Brisbane, City Point Christian City Point Christian College. Yes. Uh, you know, the response to that, not only by the Queensland government. But by significant groups of parents, was very heartening, um, and uh, they were forced. Well, the principal, I understand, is no longer there. They were forced to change mm. that, that that insistence on, on parents com being uh, compliant with uh, a lot of nonsense. Let's I want to go to another question from Bogdan to catch. Uh, who says, if I got it right, the main idea, that is, I think, your main idea, Chris, mm. uh, is that separation of high income from low income students is detrimental for academic results of students. What about so-called opportunity classes? That is separation by IQ good for students. That is, yeah, no, it's not. classes for um, mm. Mm. Uh, uh, ta gifted yeah. and talented. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I put them in the same category as selected schools. Basically, what these classes and schools do is harvest together a whole lot of uh, um, students that uh, perform very, very well in the appropriate entrance test or whatever, mm -hmm. and we pretend that that's a uh, that we we are really reaching out to all students with gifts and high potential. We are not doing that at all, and we need to look at other ways to reach out to these students other than bricks and mortar selective schools and bricks and mortar opportunity classes. There are certainly ways we can do this. Um, there's a new school proposed for Westmead in Western Sydney mm -hmm. that I'm hoping, rather than being a conventional selective school, will become a hub school with developing close relations with all other schools in Western Sydney and, and allowing students access on half a day or one day a week to follow their specialisations and, and interests and their particular talents. But um, so, you know, our current model of selective schools and opportunity classes is about 50 years old. Right, right. Um, actually, that brings to mind uh, something that I've read in a couple of places now, and that is schools who, and I don't know whether this is what you mean by a hub, uh, but schools that share their assets. So there might yeah. be a location that has a Catholic school, a government school and a private school, but they share physical assets like um, sporting grounds and so on. Yeah, yeah, Is yeah, that yeah. sort of what you're talking about? No, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's fine, a bit superficial. Uh, mm. I, I'd go back to my school where I was last principal and it wasn't introduced by me, but on Tuesday, senior students didn't come to school at all. That was their day to go to other providers and do other subjects and whatever. What's wrong with the whole region of schools declaring a, a day of the week where they'll enable their students to go and seek opportunities, including opportunities for advancement and enrichment and enrichment in, in, in the schools that are set up for that purpose or for, provide that sort of support. They're mm -hmm. not leaving. They're not, they're not abandoning their home school. They have a diverse, they have, but they have a far more diverse range of opportunities. Uh, for goodness sakes, you know, this is 2023. We've got, a, we've got an online selective school in New South Wales, but nobody knows about it because um, it has the potential to do things very, very different for gifted and high potential kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that uh, members of the Rationalist Society, of course, take particular exception to in your solution, I would suggest, is the idea that we simply accept that uh, religious schools um, uh, not only are not challenged, but they're supported. Um, and yet some of these religious schools uh, explicitly go against government policy in terms of the Australian curriculum. Mm -hmm. We have a, a comment here from Claire Harris 
uh, who says, I went to an Opus Dei school and they use their non-curriculum subjects like religion and philosophy to undermine what's taught in curriculum subjects like history and science. And this gets back to what you were saying about New Zealand and my question about what specifically are the obligations that you would um, require religious schools to observe in response to uh, uh, government funding? I mean, can, you know, can the, the, they're supposed to abide by the Australian curriculum, but that's that's a floor, not a ceiling. And, yeah, 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 and yeah, faith yeah, schools, yeah. particularly the, the uh, more zealous Christian schools, they can add to the mainstream uh, foundational Australian oh. curriculum. And as Claire says, they use their additional time to undermine the mainstream uh, curriculum, Australian curriculum. Well, uh, uh, but not only that, that sort of practice, and I'll, I'll hark back to the Four Corners program on, uh, program on the Opus Day schools. I mean, this serious infringement of, 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 of reasonable requirements in student welfare, hmm. uh, apart from anything else, and also occupational health and safety stuff. Um, you know, these rules are made for all, should be made for all schools. Um, and, um, but how, yeah, are look, to, how, how are you going to um, police it? Well, at the moment, as I say, at the moment, uh, the the various curriculum authorities in each state have a responsibility to for registration of schools that, that to make sure that they're following the curriculum, the required curriculum. I think that's a pretty uh, loose. Pro- I think that's a very loose process at the moment. We have a, uh, a clear comments again. We looked at the NISA requirements. Uh, the New South Wales Education Standards Authority requirements, and there doesn't seem to be anything to stop them, that is the religious schools, from doing this or from framing their curriculum teachings as we have to teach this, but it's wrong. We have to teach <laughs> the theory yeah, of yeah, evolution, yeah, 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 yeah. but it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I... If, if, the, if the state education authorities don't intervene, they don't actually audit, and they they don't, A, they don't know, and B, even if they did know, they're not going to do anything about it. Yeah, look, um, in um, in a couple of recent episodes, the state authority, well, one was in Queensland with, with uh, City Point, mm-hmm. but the other one in New South Wales, I mean, was something, uh, another behaving badly high fee school did in terms of a a swimming pool at King's School or something like that, yes. plunge pool or something. Yes. Well, um, for the headmaster. Yeah, I mean, basically, the language coming out of uh, uh, the New South Wales government was pretty strong to the point of, you know, saying that this would, this 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 may impact on your funding. Well, you know, the, the, we would need to ramp up that process, ramp up the registration of schools process to make sure that these obligations are being. Uh, the obligations which come with full funding are being met and don't dance around them. If they're not being met, they lose their funding. If they charge fees. But, Chris, haven't uh, politicians been challenged to stand up to the pressure from um, these religious, not just religious, the independent schools and Catholic schools lobbyists who've put huge pressure on MPs for decades. And for decades, the politicians have given in. Yeah, because because that because that is that sort of behavior uh, comes from a whole lot of myths about about school. I mean, we still talk about private schools and, and Catholic schools as if they receive very little public funding. Mm. And we have no com- few conversations in Australia about how we should be matching the obligations and operation accountability with the level of public funding, even if it was matched on a pro rata basis. Mm. Uh, that is reasonable. That is fair. That is something that governments should be insisting on. And I suspect I suspect the parent community, even now in non-governments with, with uh, schools, uh, would would not be would not be against that, uh, but the, the the school hierarchies probably would be. They, I mean, at the moment, Catholic schools because they get nine odd, say, 
uh, three quarters of, of them get either equivalent public funding to mm. public schools or similar public schools or 95 percent they're not going to want an extra five percent of money to be to be um, subject to all these obligations so i'm a realist so here. you think that they would voluntarily give up I think funding. I think they're probably uh, well. Well, as I said, there's one there's one high fee school in Sydney that actually doesn't take any public funding at all, um, and um, they've obviously done their calcs and worked out that uh, rather than be burdened with uh, stuff that they don't want to endure, they'll just bail out. That's not a bad. Which thing. raises a question as to whether or not society generally has any duty of care. Uh, towards the children who are going through such a school oh, oh, yes. when we don't oh, yes. know yeah, what yeah. they might be subject to. Sorry, there's still state and Commonwealth, well, state and Commonwealth legislation around um, occupational health and safety and student welfare and all that sort of stuff, uh, right. criminality, that, uh, that's, that, that, that doesn't go away. Okay. Let me just um, ask uh, a question which is a little bit off to the side because you mentioned Canada or other other countries, Canada, mm. New Zealand, mm. and um, it's always intrigued me that uh, the number of New Zealanders who identify as non-religious in their census is way more than the number of Australians who identify as non-religious. Almost half, 49% of New <laughs> Zealanders identify as non-religious in their census, whereas in Australia it's 39%. It's a 10 percentage point difference. And, and that's a country. Remember, uh, yeah. And I remember some years ago giving a, a talk about secularism and I, I put forward these statistics and said, I don't understand what the difference is. And there's a guy in the audience who put his hand up and he said, I can tell you in two words, Catholic schools. Because Making them non-religious. He said, because he said yeah, yeah, yeah. the Catholic school system in New Zealand was essentially merged. Now, I'd, you might correct me if my yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. assumption is wrong or my understanding of what this guy was saying was wrong, was essentially merged into the government school system. It became and, part of the state's, yeah. I'm system. sorry? Yeah, it became part of the state's provision right, of education. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And is there then, well, question, is there then a correlation between the lack of a very separate and separately funded Catholic school system, as we have here in Australia, mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. the same in New Zealand, and generationally there are fewer people coming through uh, a system that uh, encourages them to think of themselves as separate and as uh, identifying as religious in the census. I don't know. It's just a an intriguing question and i don't i don't know either maybe maybe um uh, becoming part of the state system meant that their catholicism had to be more notional than whatever I, look i can't answer i wouldn't know mm, mm. well i do i do know I somebody do know needs to do some research on it <laughs> I, they do i do know that the catholic system the catholic schools in new zealand do bend the rules a bit and while they don't charge fees, they charge bishops dues. Oh. So that is breaking down the system that was meant to be that was established in the mid seventies. Mm. Right, bishops yeah. dues. And I've noticed that they other countries, call uh, them bishops them dues being basically for uh, capital works, but basically it's a charge on uh, I think it's, it's like a thousand dollars, one half thousand dollars, something like that. But I also noticed that in. Um, in in Britain, I looked at um, I looked at these both sets of schools. In England and Wales, and yes, they bend the rules, uh, uh, and that has to be really carefully monitored. But I have to say, um, I have to say that in the public system, a high demand, high SES public school, in in many of our states, will also play ducks and drakes with enrolments. I'm sorry, it does happen. Uh, and it's clamped down, that's been clamped down on in New South Wales in recent times. But um, so uh, in, in at one level, a high demand school can do a whole range of things differently or tries to do a whole range of things differently. And it's a little bit selective. 
It brings me to, and we need to close off, but I'm going to close off with a, um, uh, use the chairman's right of reply to suggest my own solution um, yep. that you might want to think about. And that is, uh, and it, it's it's drawing a little bit on the um, school system in Finland, which, as you probably know, uh, really doesn't have this separation into um, multiple school sectors as we do. Australia is really unusual in that regard. They simply just have a, a single school sector. It's government schools and they invest very heavily in it. So my solution is uh, that we just nationalised all the Catholic schools and all the independent schools. Make them all government schools. Just take over their assets. I'm sure that, that, that politicians would find that very palatable and easy to sell to the uh, general public. I well, that's really, I mean, um, <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah. I, well, they've I, got to stand up to the, they've got, got to do to, something. Yeah, yeah, As yeah, you yeah. have said, they've got to do something differently. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I would, I would love to see um, uh, a, an ex a development of that idea into something that is sufficiently saleable hmm. to to the public and through the public to politicians. If that happened, um, all power. <laughs> well, in that sense. perhaps perhaps what we could do is combine it with your idea that there are, there are no. Um, fees, but let a thousand flowers bloom yes, yes, and yes, yes. allow a diversity of different types of schools um, as long as they abide by the obligations of the central um, curriculum and that is uh, audited so they don't sort of get away with it. Yeah, 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 yeah I know what you're saying. So you, you, inclusivity you know. and diversity in uh, principle, how that would work in practice, I think we still have to uh, sure, uh, sure. struggle with. I, it appeals to me as a good negotiating ploy. Uh, th this, <laughs> this, is, this, is our starting, this is our starting position. This could be the, um, uh, yeah, the, the uh, yeah, where we fallback, start. And our, we fall, can... our fallback is that, st that funny thing that Bonner and Greenwell uh, suggested <laughs> right. in the book in, in, uh, 12 months ago. Um, yeah. yeah, look, um, you know, if there was a, I mean, we've got a public education um, a party just started in New South Wales. One of the interesting measures is going to be how the candidates for that party um, uh, fare in the uh, election in uh, three, four and a half weeks' time. And uh, in fact, uh, Geoffrey Williams did put in a question before we, uh, uh, before we started this. Oh, yes about how effective is the public education party? It's relatively new? Yeah. Right. Yeah, look, it is. It is. Uh, it was launched about uh, 10 days ago. Oh, the right. answer to the question is we don't know. Uh, but we'll soon find out. And um, well, if we had one or two elected in the upper house in New South Wales to balance the domination of various fringe groups and lunatics, right. I think it would be, uh, that would be a powerful demonstration. Absolutely. Well, why don't we, uh, in, uh, certainly at the RSA, we'll encourage all our New South Wales members to watch out for the Public Education Party in, the, in which, who are standing candidates this is the other in the forthcoming <laughs> New South Wales election. Sorry? Yeah, in the, in, the, in the Legislative Council, but there will be, I understand, some candidates in the in the, uh, in the, the lower, lower house, house as well. Mm, okay. Yeah. If I may explain, Meredith, it's the... Um, it's the um, old Reason Party in New South Wales has merged. Yes. Oh, I see. So the Reason see. Party has closed. Yes. Right. Okay, so it's now the, those, public, no, so at least some public. of those members have become members of the Public Education yeah. Party. Yeah. And, and the Reason and Party had merged with all of the assisted dying party before that. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it solved, it solved the problem for both organisations, didn't it, uh, Jeff? Yeah, terrific. Well, yeah. All power to their arm and RSA members and uh, uh, sympathisers, 
if you live in New South Wales, please watch out for them and support them with your vote. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much for um, drawing our minds to this um, vexed issue, which has been vexed for decades, if not centuries, mm. uh, in Australia. I'm not sure that it's going to be solved in the next election, let alone the next uh, few years. But it's always good to exercise our thoughts about the principles involved um, and how, even with the best efforts, they, they can sometimes get derailed, as Gonski seemed yeah. to be. Yeah. But we should persevere. So thank you, Chris, for urging us to persevere. Thanks very much, Meredith. And thanks, thanks to your members. Uh, I really, really appreciated this. Terrific. And thank you so up much. Some things that I need and to for those, um, we do always uh, record these sessions and we will send out a copy of the recording and have it uh, on our YouTube channel for those who uh, were unable to join us tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Please watch out for our next webinar, which again will be on the fourth Wednesday of the month. Good night, everybody.